Today I'm talking to Gregory Hickok. Greg is a cognitive neuroscientist at UC Irvine. He is specialized in the neuroanatomy of language. He's also the author of a book which is called The Myth of Mirror Neurons, The Real Neuroscience of Communication and Cognition. We talk about the discovery of mirror neurons. We talk about why Greg doesn't buy this theory. We also talk a little bit about everyday mind reading and theory of mind, split brain patients, free choice, and how we justify our actions. I've been fascinated with mirror neurons for about a decade. And when I stumbled on Greg's work recently, I had to actually revise my position on what they are and just how important they are. So Greg and I talk about the discovery of mirror neurons, um, what it led to and why Greg thinks this is a fundamentally flawed approach. A little later in the talk, we take a dive into some of the most fundamental illusions that humans suffer from. And this is actually the kind of stuff that most people don't like to hear. And maybe that's why you should listen to it. Before we get started, I need to do about one minute of housekeeping. As always, first off, uh, please subscribe. Doesn't cost you anything, has tremendous value to me. Also, please tell me in the comments who you wanna see on the podcast. It's helpful in many, many ways. It makes it easier for me and it makes it more interesting for you. Also, at this stage, this podcast does rely on ads. I'm gonna try to keep them under one minute and I'm also gonna try and minimize the amount of ads. And also, I really try to be as ethical as I possibly can with the things I promote here on the channel, just an FYI. Also, notice a new feature I'm introducing in this interview, but in, in every interview I'll do after this, the bonus questions. They're gonna be a stable, and they're gonna be a little bit outrageous, um, and they become increasingly tricky for the guests to answer. I'm sure you'll enjoy them, and they're always gonna appear at the end of each episode. All that said, a brief message from the channel sponsor, which is Crypto.com, and that is a cryptocurrency debit card provider that works exactly like a normal debit card. I have this card myself, and I actually use it for all my everyday purchases. But right now, I want to tell you about their latest accomplishment, I guess. They're launching an exchange and something called The Syndicate. This is essentially a fundraising platform for crypto companies, but what it means for the users of the exchange is that they can buy listed tokens at a severe discount. Right now, EOS is being listed, and by using the syndicate, you can get a 50% discount on EOS tokens. I'm not going to go into all the details here, and you can also top off your crypto debit card with EOS, by the way. Check the link below for more information, and check the other link below to get your own crypto debit card, a free $50 and a 2% cash bag. With all that out of the way, I bring you Greg Hickard. Greg, welcome on the show. Thank you, it's nice to be here. Yeah, yeah, in, in your office, right? Yes. Okay, we're gonna talk about mirror neurons and um, some of the misconceptions surrounding them. But um, I would love to just start with, with the history of, of it. So they were discovered, quote unquote, by a team of, uh, not quote unquote, they were discovered in 1992 by a team of Italian scientists, right? Maybe you could just lay that out for us. Yeah, so it was a group of um, basically motor control neuroscientists. They were studying reaching and grasping in macaque monkeys um, and a very well-known renowned uh, research group that has done some excellent work in that area. And they were just studying how um, monkeys take a visual shape information about an object and use that to guide reaching actions, essentially. So very interesting work. Um, uh, and they noticed in, in the middle of an experiment that um, cells started firing uh, when the researchers reached in and grabbed the objects that they were using as part of the experiment. So in between trials, they would swap out one object for another, and they started to notice that the cells would fire during the reaching and grasping part. And that was interesting because no one had ever seen um, motor cortex cells responding to actions. They respond to the presence or observation of objects, that was already known, but never actions. And so they got pretty interested in this and then set up these experiments to document how consistent this was, and that was the discovery of mirror neurons. They weren't right. called mirror neurons then. 
No, right. But but I but the, I guess the um the exceptional part had to do with the fact that the, the the monkeys didn't have to perform these actions themselves, right? It was the mere observation of it. It was the observation of it that caused it, which you know, in the broader context, observing things can cause motor cells to activate. That was part of the paradigm that they were studying. Um, you could present a, a simple object, a cylinder or something, to the animal, and motor cortex cells would respond in interesting ways. Um, and but here was an action that the cell would respond to, and that was right. New and different, and yeah. So, and and of course, when when uh, discoveries are made in uh, primates or in other animals, it it only takes uh, five minutes for the whole world to to transfer those observations to human beings, typically. <laughs> Well, yeah, oftentimes when we're studying um, uh, macaques and other animal models, it is not necessarily to understand how that particular species solves problems in their world. It's to understand how brains in general, um, and in particular our brains, solve, solve these complicated problems. Right, right. And I, and I do want to get into uh, <laughs> so how the scientific community responded to this uh, finding. Um, But but I just want to make it so so once they made this observa the initial observation and they started looking into it they pursued it I, I assume pretty um, uh, eagerly but um, but these neurons they don't fire in all cases right it, it, is is it correct to say that if if they were if the monkeys were watching an unknown behavior nothing yeah. happened right yeah so well. Um, They were obviously trained um, to, you know, perform tasks and to and to do this. So it was within a set of behaviors that the monkeys were familiar with already. Right. Um, in those initial studies, they tried um, control conditions like uh, seeing if the cells would respond to grasping of objects with tools, something that the monkeys hadn't seen before, and they didn't respond to that. Um, they right. Didn't respond to, you know, kind of waving the hands around. You know, generally. Right. So, and just so for the record, th these monkeys aren't tool, tool using monkeys. I'm, I mean, that might be in the wild. Um, no, I don't believe they are. Um, and yeah, later right. on, they were actually discovered if you train them enough, um, so called mirror neurons will respond to tool actions, hmm. um, which they thought was very interesting. I, you know, it. Yeah, it's a little complicated. So. It's complicated, but it, but it does sort of imply that if if the behavior is familiar, that's what potentially triggers yes. something yes. right yes. okay but you you actually uh we haven't even <laughs> gone into that yet but you actually have a i don't want to call it a controversial theory at, at all but you you sort of go against the mainstream science and pop culture idea of mirror neurons and we, we're we're gonna get into that but let's just talk about so in the wake of this finding it took it took like a decade before people really started getting interest, interested in this. And then all of a sudden mirror neurons were <laughs> hailed as the new, what, what, what did they call it? They called it the, um, not the, the big bang of, of yeah. psychology or neuroscience or something like that. They, they called it a lot of things, big bang. They called it, uh, you know, what uh, mirror neurons will do for psychology and neuroscience, what DNA did for biology. I mean, it, right. was, it was a big deal. And if it panned <laughs> out, it would have been, honestly, it was, It was a big deal. If you could explain all these human behaviors from, from language to autism um, with simple mirror neurons that exist in macaque monkeys, that'd be big, right? I mean, that'd be a, right. That'd right. Be huge. So it got justified attention for the ideas. Right. I, I watched your, um, you did a talk at the Skeptic Society, I believe, in 2014. I'm going to leave a link for that. It's an hour and a half, but you, you, you pretty much uh, <laughs> elaborate on, on this whole theory, but both the original findings, but also your criticism of, of this whole phenomenon. Uh, but but let's, just, let's just talk about, so people have been tried to use mirror neurons to explain language, mind reading in the colloquial and the woo sense and um, empathy uh, and art appreciation all sorts of things how did did you jump on that bandwagon initially or no uh, i i mean you can kind of use me as a an example of the scientific reaction to this stuff so because <laughs> I, I, i was in the field kind of you know and exposed to it 
-hmm. as a semi outsider. I mean, I don't, I didn't study motor control much then when they were discovered. And I heard a talk um, by Ritz Alati, one of the, the major um, discoverers uh, back in the day before they, they got super popular. And they were interesting. You know, I kind of bought the idea that, that these cells were doing something with respect to action understanding in macaque monkeys. I mean, it, you know, the data seemed to support that, which is part of the, uh, the appeal of the theory. Um, but then when it was extrapolated to language, that's my area of work, I knew it couldn't apply. It, didn't, mm. it just didn't work because we knew that there were plenty of cases, in fact, you know, a very common syndrome called Broca's aphasia, where people can have damage to their motor speech areas that have very little impact on their receptive or comprehension ability of speech. And that's the prediction that the, the mirror neuron claims have. Right. And so I was like, okay, well maybe it works in macaques, but it doesn't work for humans. Um, and so I was always a bit skeptical of the mm. extrapolation to humans. Um, so, you know, um, but that's and, and let, let's just unpack that in, in layman's terms. So there's an area of the brain called the bro broca, or broca okay. and which governs speech production and well, comprehension. No, <laughs> so there, is a, there is an area called Broca's area. It's a, a long known area since Paul Broca discovered it. Uh, he was named after him in the 1860s. Um, and it was associated with uh, production speech deficits. And of course, we know a lot more about that now, and it's more complicated and so on, but you know, just the kind of classical story. Right. Um, and so, you know, if you damage or, or in interfere with activity in this area and surrounding areas, you end up with uh, sometimes severe difficulties in producing speech. So people will just struggle to form mm. words. Um, but it, the, the syndrome is such that people with this problem often don't have any trouble or any significant trouble, at least at the single word level, uh, comprehending speech. Right. So you get this dissociation. So, right. um, yeah, so that, that shows that you can damage motor related areas for a, uh, an action, in this case speech, without interfering with receptive or right. Understanding. Right. It. So, so let's so let's just dive into your your criticism again. So, you're not necessarily saying that mirror neurons aren't real. You, that you do believe that that they exist. Correct. But so, what you're saying is is that that there is a correlation, but the causal relation is misunderstood. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So, I mean, the basic discovery is that <clears throat> that mirror what makes mirror neurons mirror neurons is that they respond when the monkey is reaching and grasping for an object. You know? so, right. So they're motor in that sense, they're motor cells. Um, but they'll also respond when observing another, and this usually the experimenter reaching and grasping or doing other kinds of actions with respect to these objects. So we, we kind of think we know what, or, you know, everyone kind of thinks they know what they're doing on the motor side. They're helping to plan these movements. But what are they doing in the observation side? Um, and so that was the real question. Why are these cells responding to the ops, just the observation? Um, and initially, the, the researchers in 1992, if you, if you go back and read the original paper, um, the very first paragraph of their discussion of the results laid out a theory that said, well, you know, um, uh, it, it might be useful in planning movements if you can take information about other animals' actions. So, for example, if we were here live together and I stuck my hand out to shake your hand, that's an action that is useful in guiding your action selection. You would want to mirror that. Right. Shake my hand. Yeah, I, I kind of almost, almost, yeah, yeah, almost feel right. like you want to do it right, <laughs> when I shake my hand out. Um, so, and, and other actions too, you know, if I, if I hand you something, you see an action coming. Well, there's an appropriate action response to that. So, mm. And monkeys presumably can make use of this information too. If, if one animal is being aggressive towards another, you'd want to take account of that action and plan your actions accordingly. Or um, if they're grooming, you might want to turn your back so that you can, you know, give access. So it makes sense that you would want to use action information to guide your own actions. Um, but these responses in mirror cells were so, at least some of them, certainly not all of them, per pretty much mimicked the same action and 
while well, humans will have mirror-like actions like the handshake thing, macaques don't typically have that behavior. They won't copy and imitate directly what mm -hmm. other animals are doing. And so the researchers very reasonably said, you know, there's no res action response that the, that the monkeys are generating that has this mirror-like behavior. So it can't just be motor planning. What else could it be? And so that's when they hit on this idea that maybe it has to do with understanding what the actions are about. Mm. The logic of that is that, you know, if, if you understand your own actions, so if you reach out and grab your coffee cup or whatever, and you understand what that means when you do it, as you watch me reach for my coffee cup, you can simulate that action in your own head. And since you know what it means when you do it, that gets you into an understanding of what I'm doing. So right. it's a the motor simulation theory of action understanding. And that's that's the basic idea behind mirror okay. knowledge, how it's so, so 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 what is the evidence that 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 this that these mirror neurons even exist in in people? Because the way they um they investigated with the monkeys was um inserting what are they called um electrodes or, right. in, into into their brains right no one no one wants to do that i mean elon musk um seemingly has a few volunteers that are <laughs> willing to do that but how, how can you even prove the existence of these neurons in humans yeah well um the evidence is actually pretty scant um so there is evidence uh for their existence so we can do things with functional mri which is a uh tool for measuring brain activity, not of individual neurons, but of large patches of neurons. Mm. Um, and so you can make some inferences about that. And if you do fMRI in a, in a particular way, which we don't need to get into, you can, make, <laughs> you can make inferences about whether a given population of cells is responding both to the you know, observation and execution. So, and there was one study that did that and seemed to show some evidence, but That, mm. that's really only one study that, that showed that um, in right. healthy people. We can do recordings of individual cells in certain human populations, in particular those undergoing neurosurgery, where for clinical reasons we want to record from these cells. And um, there are opportunities to do research under those environments. And, and, those, and there was a study that also showed um, mirror-like properties in human cells, individual cells. So Um, so they do seem to exist, at least there's some evidence, even though there isn't a ton of it. Right. The better evidence, though, is just behavior. So if I, you know, give an action, so suppose I do this, you can copy it perfectly. So presumably there's a way for you to take an action and translate it into your own motor program um, to replicate that action. And right. that, that's, there's got to, just from that alone, there's got to be a neural circuit that can perform that translation. And that's essentially what mirror neurons are doing. Right, so, so, so I don't know a whole lot about um, cells or cell biology or <laughs> neuroscience, but I do know that cells, I'm, I mean, I, I, I feel like there, maybe you can clear this up. I feel like there's sometimes a misconception here that cells typically aren't special but they're sometimes specialized. Yeah, so is, maybe what you're getting at is that, you know, neurons, neurons in different parts of the brain can have very similar properties in terms of, I mean, they take inputs from other cells and then they fire, generate some right. output. There are differences and there's lots of different types of neurons and there's lots of interesting complexities there. But essentially right. a neuron, you know, when you abstract away from some of the details, a neuron is a neuron. And the way, and it just, it takes inputs and it generates outputs. Right. Um, what makes it unique is its position in a network. Um, and so, yes, the, the, depending on what network it's in, it can be, it, it will get different types of inputs from other cells and other networks. Works, and in that sense, it can be specialized for different functions. So right. just in this context, there are mirror neurons, for example, that respond preferentially to different kinds of actions. So the most common is a grasping action, but you can also find cells that will respond to like a tearing action or a flicking action or, a, you know, different. So, the, so that, that is highly specialized though. It is specialized and, and 
yes. Uh, and what made it interesting is that you could, if you could find a cell, so there's also these cells that will respond to particular kinds of grasps. So there are different kinds of grasps. If you grasp a, grasp a cup like this, that's one kind of grasp. If you kind of do a fine grasp like that, that's a different kind of grasp. And there are cells in motor areas that will specialize or preferentially respond during different types of grasps. Mm. And so that's true in macaques. Um, and what they found is that there are some of these cells that will respond to the same sort of grasp, both, both in execution when you're generating the grasp and when you're observing it. So right. there's correspondence. And that's these strictly um, congruent, as they're called, mirror neurons, which is it's something that macaques typically don't do. Um, and so that's, that's, again, why they had this idea that maybe it's more to do with understanding than with generating actions. Right. I, I guess one of the things that I sort of vaguely remember um, as I think I was, I think I was studying psychology as an as an as an elective at the when I heard about neurons, but I remember thinking the 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 weird part seemed to be that so all these so if if, you, if I watch you observe you perform some action. And then I do, whether I copy that action or just think about uh, imagining it, there seems to be, it, it seems to be a paradox almost that, that that's not somehow connected to my memory circuits. Um, <clears throat> or well, maybe that's just a layman's misconception of it. Yeah, I mean, there are connections to memory circuits you know, uh, for all sorts of things that you observe. And you, so you, right now you presumably remember that my action, well, you could tell me, was my action this or was it this, right? You can remember. So I do remember. Uh, yeah. yeah so, so, you know, it does connect to memory circuits and there's, that's a whole other world of how that information gets mm. in and stored. And, um, but yeah, I mean, that, yeah, that's, that's, that's part of the, Right. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I just I just felt that that this uh, maybe a, a slightly fantastical way that it was presented in the media at least was that it has nothing to do with memory circuits. It's an automatic response mm -hmm. that just happens when you when you interact with other people, and especially this empathy thesis that right. this is, this is raw empathy almost. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You don't buy yeah, into so that at is, all. You're absolutely right. It is assumed to be a very automatic, unconscious triggering like response so mm. you automatic if you see me reaching for my coffee cup you simulate that action in your own motor system and you immediately from that understand what i'm doing you know what what, what right. that action is about so yeah you're absolutely right and it's not something you have to think about um uh so so that's true but it might be helpful to back up a little bit and and kind of um uh follow the logic through of of how this argument you know, when right. please. Um, so, I mean, one of the one of the key things that's often done in neuroscience when you're doing um, cellular recording and you find these response properties, one of the limitations of that is that it's purely correlational. So, it mm -hmm. responds during observation, um, but the question is: Is it critical for for observation, or is it just you know firing for some other reason that you know is this correlated with this behavior? And um, the, the way that that's typically sorted out is to deactivate that part of cortex. And there's different ways you can do it. You can just kind of apply an ice cube or a cooling agent to the, the brain region you're studying, and that will suppress activity there. Um, and then you can look to see if the animal has a deficit in, the, in that ability. So, you know, a, a natural follow-up to the discovery of mirror neurons would have been to deactivate the network and um, and see if the animal suddenly doesn't understand as well what other right. animals are. No, no monkey study has ever reported such a thing. Um, it, it seems as if it's never been done, which is a bit puzzling. Um, so, you know, it, that would have been the key test. So disrupting the function is what really proves the, the idea, essentially. Right. I, I was actually going to ask you about maybe on a more general level, but the degree to which you can generalize from neuroscientific findings 
that that's that's something because because I'm like one thing is you're almost bound to always observe some sort of correlation. You, so you you give people some sort of stimulus and then you see what happens in their brain. But when we're talking about non-physical actions, it seems to me that you like it's it's almost a catch twenty two at least potentially. You don't really know what what triggers and what what what's cause and effect essentially. Yeah, so that's, I mean, the, the causal uh, role of these cells or these networks of cells in a behavior is, is really what's at issue um, in, in sorting out whether the mirror neuron theory is correct. Um, and right. like I said, there hadn't been any work in monkeys. There still hasn't been a demonstration that disrupting the mirror network causes a problem in action understanding. Um, right. There's plenty of data in humans, though, which is where I, I my species of choice for study is humans. Um, and there's plenty of, uh, of experiments of nature where people have damage to different brain areas and we can see disruptions. And there are, like I said, examples of cases, plenty of examples of cases where people lose the motor ability to either perform actions, whether it's speech or manual movements or generating facial expressions or whatever. Right. But it spares their ability to understand these things. And so the human evidence clearly refutes the the theory that comes out of um, you know the monkey work, and right. so that, that was that was my big problem with the idea, especially as it generalized to humans. Um, right and uh, right, so that's that's where my skepticism of the idea came from. Right, and and of course that also means that all these um, proposed areas that are. That were that were all of a sudden supposed to be, I'm not even going to say guided by, but but almost produced by the mirror neurons. That also can't be right. Yeah. So the 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 idea of mirror neurons when it was first discovered didn't get much attention, like you mentioned. It took about a decade. And what happened right. to popularize them is the the basic mirroring mechanism for understanding was extrapolated to humans. So. The logic was, well, if macaques understand other macaques' actions by simulating it in the motor system, um, and if humans have mirror neurons, then we can think about human-related behaviors. And, and so language was one of the first ones that they considered. Language or speech is a kind of action. And so um, if I can simulate in my motor system your speech acts, then that's how I can understand language. And so that was the extrapolation there. Mm. Uh, if you think about empathy, well, empathy is kind of like, you know, me experiencing what you're experiencing, and then that right. automatically gives rise to a, a feeling of empathy. Um, and so it, it was extrapolated to all these other domains. But again, the point is, if the fundamental mechanism doesn't exist, if, if that's not what it's doing, then it's very difficult to extrapolate to humans. Right. And I guess this is sort of uh, an, an interesting case of a scientific finding and, and, and people just take it and run with it and apply it to all sorts of phenomena. And the phenomena are real, yes. but the correlation between the ideas is well, very vague. It's a nice, simple explanation for complicated things. So all right, right. I actually, I was, I was gonna. I forget, I'm glad you say that because I was thinking as I fell asleep last night that neuroscience seems to be an area where you can't just assume that Occam's razor is the best tool, right? Is, yeah. Isn't that correct? Well, yeah. I mean, it, it, brains are incredibly complicated. Probably right. the most compu complicated thing in in the universe um, in terms of. <laughs> billions of con billions of cells and trillions of connections and yeah it's it's like it's like the cosmos in our head um and so it's it would in a way be surprising if things were as simple as as you know motor simulation or something like that at, at right that level um right so yeah it uh it, it's complicated but these all of these theories these ideas that mirror neurons are extrapolated to from language to theory of mind or, or mind reading, which is what you were talking Let, about. Yeah, let's get into that in a second. Please yeah, continue. So, so all of those areas um, have elaborate fields. There are people who study this their whole lives right. and build up elaborate theories of how language works and how theory of mind works and all these things. And here, 
and here came mirror neurons saying, look, it's just simulation. There are these simple cells that resonate with the observation of some action or whatever. And that, and, and you get the, the output, the behavior for free. It's so simple. And so, and it applies across domains. So we're basically explaining everything with this one simple mechanism. And we have an evolutionary kind of explanation. Here's where, here's the origins of this stuff. Right. We see in animals and it's grounded in, in the way that individual cells fire. I mean, this was really exciting because it was, it was like discovering DNA essentially for, <laughs> for all of the mind's right. behavior. And, but it just right. turned out not to be true. Yeah. I, so, okay. So this is sort of anecdotal, but I'm, um, I'm reading a book at the moment by a guy called Matthew Hudson. I don't know if you know, I, I was unfamiliar with him. Um, I believe it's called the seven ways of magical thinking or something like that. He basically goes through all sorts of <laughs> cognitive misconceptions. Um, so some of it's not correct, just for the record. I caught him in a, in a few <laughs> trivial mistakes. Oh. But he describes some super interesting um, experiments were uh, re involving dogs and their owners. Mm. So that he basically creates like an um, experimental um, setup where 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 an owner a dog owner thinks that his or her dog ate their sandwich or their their treat not the dog's treat and in some cases it did and in other cases it didn't so what they're investigating is uh whether the dog feels shame but the but the thing is what what we humans perceive as shame in these poor dogs is is really it, we trigger it in them mm. so th they essentially respond to so so the the response of the owner, if he starts scolding his dog, uh, the dog will respond with shame, even yeah. though it did nothing wrong at all. Right, right. That's right. that sort of doesn't tie that neatly in with the mirror neuron hypothesis either. Um, no, or, yeah. I, I, mean, I guess maybe it does. <laughs> well, um, yeah. Let's. Well, well, you know, no, I don't think it does. I mean, suppose. Presumably what the dog is expressing shame or what's perceived as shame or yes, whatever. Yeah. Um, but what's being observed is not shame. It is no. anger or, you know, whatever. So, <laughs> it's an aggression. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's, so it's an appropriate response to what the animal is perceiving, but it's not a mirror response. No. Um, so, and, and that's, that's the typical case. I mean, even if you look at mirror neurons, um, there were plenty of cells, in fact, almost an equal number of cells to the classic congruent mirror neurons that responded in an opposite way. So um, you had a cell that would respond uh, motorically to the animal reaching and grasping, but it didn't respond to the observation of grasping. It responded to the observation of placing an object, mm. the opposite of grasping. So, and that makes perfect sense, right? So again, like if I hand you something, if I if I reach and put something down in front of you, um, I'm placing, that's one action, but your appropriate response is not to place something. Not to place so, more, no, it's yeah. To it, right? <laughs> so those kind of opposite um, responses are very appropriate and it makes perfect sense. And animals do that all the time. Right. Um, so uh, unfortunately, the theoretical implications of that class of mirror cells, they're, they're still classified as mirror-like cells, um, didn't get much attention, theoretically. They focused on these ones that were congruent, even though the frequency of these other types is quite high. And if you take the bigger picture and think about all the different types of responses that you get in mirror neurons, a, a different picture emerges. It's one in which you're, you're looking at actions and you're using actions to select appropriate responses, some of which under certain circumstances may be mirroring like a handshake. But in most other cases, it's a non-mirror response that is still appropriate to the action. Right. And fundamentally, I think that's what they've discovered. Very interesting from a neuroscientific standpoint and to understand motor control. But, you know, we wouldn't be talking about it now if that was the what came out right. of all the studies no one would care um, from right. the public essentially but but i guess it, it also makes sense because we're talking if 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 these mechanisms were to be selected for over time over thousands and thousands of years 
they would have to have something to do with social interaction with other people in a sense. I, I, I mean, I'm not sure the, the brain cares whether, whether I, you know, I'm, I'm, whether I'm interacting with other people, but, but selection does yeah. in a sense. Is, is there, um, what do we know from a neuroscientific point of view about dealing with other people versus dealing with dead stuff? Yeah, um, I don't know that, I mean, there are people who study, so, I mean, who, their field is social neuroscience, and, right. um, and, and there are different aspects of that that you can study. So you can study emotional responses, you can study social interaction. Some people study it from an, uh, an observation standpoint, like what information am I getting when I watch you behave, um, and what brain areas are involved in that. Um, right. It turns out that a critical area um, that seems to be involved in observing and uh, observing other people's action is not part of the mirror circuit at all, but part of a temp the mirror circuit's kind of frontal and parietal. Uh, but a temporal lobe region known as the superior temporal sulcus in both macaques and in humans seems to be involved in perceiving other people's actions. And it in fact shows more highly specific responses to different types of actions. Even right. in macaques, that was well known from the 80s, I think. Um, so there, there is a competitor area to this mirror circuit that looks like it's responding to social relevant actions. Um, but yeah, so people study social neuroscience from a, a, a broad perspective. I don't know, I mean, I don't think anyone has thought it within the mirror system to study differences between responses to social actions versus you know, responding to a snake that's coiling in front of you. Um, right. and the kind of action that you might want to generate in response. That, that, that's uh, my my wife and I just just passed a snake two days ago, uh, and I intuitively, you know, yeah. uh, jumped, uh, startled, and and right. pulled her away from the snake. So, and that that seemed like a very different response from yeah. any yeah. person I could meet. And that tells you that we have the ability to interpret actions that we don't generate ourselves. So, you know, we I don't know. coil. Um, but you see a snake slithering along and coiling, doing whatever snakes Coil, do. Yeah. And it, it. It's not like we sit there saying, duh, too bad I can't simulate that. Otherwise, I'd know what to do. No, we know exactly what to do. <laughs> right. Uh, right. Even though, even though but, but we that, But that's that. so basic for survival that it's almost, it should be obvious that, that we, it, could, could have not, it could not have been selected for over right. time that we'd copied, whether it be placing a cup or coiling like the snake or, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we need, we from an evolutionary standpoint, from a survival standpoint, we need right. to be able to interpret um, lots of different actions from lots of right. different species, even if we can't generate it. Now, to, to, um, to be fair to the mirror neuron folks, they recognize this fact. I mean, they, the, the, that is the people who promote the mirror neuron theory of action understanding. They recognize it, they've acknowledged it. It has to be the case. What they argue though is that, is that the understanding that we get of a bird fly, watching a bird fly or watching a snake coil is not true understanding. Um, and their term is understanding from the inside, um, which it's a little, gets a little fuzzy how to define that exactly, but you can, you can imagine the situation. So, um, um, you know, suppose you play an instrument and uh, you know what it's like to generate the actions that produce the music on that instrument. And you watch someone pick up your instrument and depending on how they hold it, um, you'll probably know whether they're skilled or know how to play that instrument or not. So you have some inside knowledge in a sense. Right. It could be so, very painful, actually, the scenario you're describing. I've tried that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Watching and so have you, I bet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's something to that idea, but the question of, of what that adds in terms of the neurobiology and what do we mean by understanding and all this sort of thing, certainly experience with um, an action adds something to your understanding of, of that, but the mm. understanding that you get isn't necessarily just from simulation. Like you don't, it's, it's not that you're, when you watch someone pick up your instrument of choice that you're simulating the movements necessarily and that's what's getting you to the understanding it, it, once you start digging in you realize that there there's all these complications and subtleties that start not making sense 
Right. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I hope we sort of managed to to demonstrate that. But just to wrap this very rough and general um, version of your theory. So what you're saying is mirror neurons are real. They highly likely exist in humans, but almost certainly do. But they haven't really been studied as and we could actually study them uh, by, for instance, um, Taking what was that um, freezing uh, certain areas or cooling down certain areas of the brain? But you, but you. So what you're saying is they're integrated in a much more complex web of processes. Is that correct? Yeah, they're, they're part of a bigger system that aren't particularly involved in understanding at its core. Um, mm. They're more. And that goes for empathy and these things too. You know, the extrapolation to empathy is just—it's a different ball game and. I think it needs to be studied separately to understand the relation. Certainly the foundation for extrapolating to empathy has been, you know, the latter has been kicked out from beneath these ideas. Right. In the sense that if, if, if simulation is the basis of understanding and then you can simulate feelings, then that's what gets you empathy. Um, the premise is gone. So it may be that we're simulating you know, feelings in other people, and that's what empathy is about. But that has nothing to do with mirror neurons. That's just how empathy works. Um, so, <laughs> right. You know, right. If, if, it, if that's how it turns out. Um, it, okay, okay, right. Yeah, but, you know, I, I'm not an expert on empathy, and I'm, I'm you know, not a ton has been... Um, but I, I mean, I, I can't help thinking, because uh, I'm... I'm uh, actually, let's just... Because part of empathy... And I know you just said you're not an expert on empathy, nor am I, but, but I'm going to dive into it anyways. But a part of this, of empathy, is feeling what other people feel. And from a neuroscience or a neurobiological point of view, that has to do with neurotransmitters, which are really biochemical reactions. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know. You, yeah, okay, we, we shouldn't go too much into this. But an emotion, a raw emotion from a neurobiological perspective has to do with chemicals triggered in your brain. Not just your brain, but, but and, and actually in many animals, even extremely simple animals have the same basic raw emotions if we look at them as neurotransmitters. Yeah, well, everything that your brain does is dependent on neurotransmitters and, con and connections. So we're talking about right. particular neurotransmitters in particular circuits triggered by particular situations. And so, yes, it, in that sense, it's extremely complicated. And, you know, just simple mind experiments, thought experiments can, I think, dispel the idea that we're just blindly mirroring people uh, and that's the basis of, of our emotion. So consider, you know, suppose you have a dear friend who's suffering um, for what, you know, could be an, an emotional strain. They, they, they lost their job, say, something right. not too gruesome. <laughs> sure. Um, and you're like, oh my gosh, I feel so, you know, they're sad and you're feeling sad for them. And like, oh, you're really empathizing with them. Now suppose there's a bitter enemy at, at work or, you know, something and they lost their job. And they're extremely sad. The same sensory input is coming in. We, we're not going to simulate that. And, you know, we, it, there's more complicated things right. that have to go on to trigger these responses. Um, right. And so a simple simulate, even for empathy, if we just take the simplest example, um, there's a lot more that's, uh, of complexity that goes into whether we empathize, how much, what it triggers, you know, all these sorts of things. So it's to, to say that mirror neurons are the basis of all these things and it explains empathy is just, even if you assume mirror neuron theory is to some extent correct, it doesn't explain empathy. Yeah, you, you pretty much just, just disproved it with, with that simple example. Yeah, so, right, that's, that's kind of the, the problem. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, because we, we and, and again, no, I'm not going to actually say, I was going to talk about mental schema and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, but let's not get into this. I do want to talk about uh, this. Most of these uh, questions are based on the talk you gave, uh, the 2014 talk at the Skeptic Society. But you talked a little bit about mind reading. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of uh, an odd term 
that is usually associated with um, with ESP. But there's also actually a sense in which we're all mind readers. It's it seems to me that it's it's almost like a defining feature of being human. Right. But but here's my question to you. No, actually, you want to just elaborate on that, and I can ask my follow up question. Yeah. So my, mind reading is kind of an unfortunate term. Um, theory of I mind. like it. I, I like it. Yeah. It's kind of <laughs> don't don't be ashamed, Greg. <laughs> theory, it's not my turn. Uh, theory of mind is, a, is another term that's often used. Um, right. But yeah, it's it's theory of mind. Let's explain what that is. That is the yeah. capability of pl please. Well, let me just let me give you an example. You can just sure. watch me. So what, what's going through my head right now? <laughs> you lost something. Lost something, right. So that's, you're reading my mind. <laughs> you're observing some actions. I'm looking for something. You can, right. you can infer that. And because you understand that my behaviors are not random, they're generated by intentions and desires and needs, you are assuming, oh, the reason he's looking in his pockets and looking around, there's got to be a reason. What's a reasonable explanation for that? Well, he's obviously looking for something. Right. Um, you know, depending on the context, you know, if I was if I was standing at my car door and looking in, you know, in my bag and in my pockets, you'd say, oh, he, he lost his keys. You could make pretty good inferences about that. Right. That, that's all mind reading refers to is the ability to make guesses or inferences about what's what is driving someone else's behavior. Right. Okay. But okay. So th this is really interesting. I, and I actually inadvertently, I almost feel like you just made the, uh, a case in favor of mirror neurons here. Cause, yes. cause I know what you just did now, but when you started searching your pockets, I actually thought for a second and a half, maybe that, Oh, he's looking for something to, to prove this anecdote. He's going to tell yeah. me, or as you know, yeah. and then I'm like, Oh yeah, of course. So the, so there's like a meta level to, to, to that, but, and I try it. But, so I, I dabble in acting on the side as well. And I have a reading partner and this is something most actors will recognize. So you, you go over your lines, you rehearse. And at one point, your reading partner says, what are you doing? And you're like, what do you mean? What am I doing? You forget for a second, that's just one of the lines. But he or she delivers it in such a credible manner yeah, that you're right. just torn out of right, right. what you're doing. And that's what you just did to me. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. excellent acting chops. Uh, but that's a side note. But what I, but, but that could be like, you see where I'm going with this? Could, could that be mirror neurons? Sort of distracting me from the, from the, what's really going on here, you making a point. Well, let, let's think about it. So let's just apply the mirror neuron theory. So the first thing I do is I tap my chest and I- Right, my, okay, my yeah, I, I can okay. already see. So I wanna tap my chest. Yeah, so, and, and is that, if you simulated that action in your brain, does that help you understand what I'm doing? No? I mean, I, I, I mean maybe it did, because, uh, no, I don't know. It, <laughs> I guess it's, yes, simulating well, is uh, stress, so, a stretch probably. So, you know, in these cases where we have, you know, you've, you've done the same thing, you've looked in a shirt pocket and you can imagine, oh, that, that might work. But suppose you're watching, you've watched me do something that you've never done before. Um, I mean, think of, think of anything. You can think of, uh, do you surf? For you. I've tried it, but <laughs> okay. I'm not a surfer. Suppose, suppose you hadn't. <clears throat> I've surfed all my life. Suppose you're watching me out in the water and I'm sitting on my board and then I flip my board around and start paddling. You've never, suppose you've never done that. Before. Right, 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 right. Do you need to imagine you sitting on a board? Does your motor system need to simulate all those actions for you to understand that I'm trying to catch a wave? You know? I mean, it's a rhetorical question, of course, but uh, yeah, I, I see where you're going. So, so and then you can, you can think of other examples. So, um, so uh, take, take the case where you can simulate the action perfectly. So that the, an example I use is, imagine we have a cup sitting here. So here's a cup and I have a, you know, we just grab a, here's another prop. So here I have a cup and here I have this. Right. And, and I start doing this, right? Right, right. Okay, so now you simulate that action. Just simulate that, you know, you can pretend you're simulating that action. So what does it mean? 
What is that? So you've simulated the action. What does it actually mean? I mean, well, there's a retrieval of information or... I mean, like, what am I doing here? Yeah, you're not pouring, not but that's, pouring, right? but that's the, the so, thing you okay, trigger. Okay. Yeah, but wait. So we'll just do a live demo here. Exact same motor actions. Now don't do I'm it. Doing. You're ruining your coffee. I know. It's going to be a little watered down, but right. for science. Right. So, so this action was the same from your motor standpoint. If you simulated those two actions, in one case, it, it leads to pouring and watery right. coffee. And in another case, it leads to kind of silly, you know, something else that's not. Right. Pouring. Right. If this was empty and I wasn't pouring, it's not pouring. It's or not pouring, if, right? If we're thinking about it from the perspective of the cup. It's filling, not pouring. Um, sure. If you told me not to do it, don't. You did. You told me not. I don't did. do it. That's <laughs> defying. <laughs> it's a right, right, right. In other right. words, the, the the understanding doesn't come from the movements. So if all you're doing is simulating movements, then all you're getting is an understanding of rotation. And right. that's not what we're talking about here. We're under, we're talking about understanding intentions. And right. Okay. So you, you, at this, those are more complicated. Right. Right. At, at this point, you certainly managed to convince me that, um, that it's way more complex than just, uh, firing of simultaneous neurons. <laughs> but, but so in, and that leads me to, um, let's talk about theory of mind. Okay. The, these mind reading abilities we have so this is actually something that was um i mean it's something we all intuitively understand right we and, and let's explain theory of mind you you want to do it i can do it um yes why don't you go ahead okay so this is probably a crude simplification but it's basically a phenomenon found in some primates and in humans which makes us able to predict that other people uh, perform actions on the basis of some sort of psychological process. Meaning, I know that you have, uh, I assume that you have some sort of understanding. So you have motives, you have wants, needs, desires, and those inform and guide your actions. And I understand that not just for myself, but also for you. And actually, just to add to that, it seems that this is sort of my theory, but it is, I th feel like the evidence backs it. It seems that you actually, ironically, maybe you develop theory of mind before you, or not you, but, but some primates develop it before they develop a self understanding. I, I don't know the answer to that. The, um, uh, it, it's, it's more, it's, it's more an observation in some yeah. species that, yeah. that seem to have, uh, I'm actually talking to uh, Gordon Gallup uh, about okay. this. Um, okay. So he can shed some light on it uh, and perhaps ridicule this, this idea, but okay. So let's not go into this, but theory of mind, here's my question to you, Greg, is it an on off switch or is it a continuum? Is it an on-off switch or a continuum? Um, is it a skill we have or don't have? It's certainly a skill we have as humans. I mean, it's it's uh, uh, in, intuiting the intention of what other people are doing and understanding. I mean, one one key thing that was in your definition, but maybe not emphasized for the listeners and viewers, is that the, a, a key thing is to understand that that your mind and your motivations can be different from mine. Right. So Thank you for stressing that. Yeah. Appreciating that distinction. So the classic theory of mind test that's done in children is they'll watch a couple of puppets and one, one will, you know, put a toy in a box and then it will leave the room. And then the other puppet moves the toy to the other box. And then the first puppet comes back into the room and you ask the kid, where is the puppet going to look for the, for the toy. Where does he think it is? Yeah. yeah, where does he think it is? And so if they're basing it on actual information, well, it's in this other box. So, but they understand that the puppet knows certain things and they don't know that it's in the other box because they didn't right. see it happen. And so, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the classic test. And, and uh, very young children aren't able to solve this problem. Right. Um, is it like age four, three, four, something, or something like that? Like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and that gets complicated. There are some demonstrations that kids younger than that can actually do it if you change the task up a little bit 
um, gets a bit complicated. But nonetheless, yeah, so that's, that's the classic story. Right. Uh, and humans do this naturally, and it's something that is studied quite extensively. Um, and there's lots of ideas behind how it works, and I'm not an expert in it, so I won't be that helpful. But right, right. But I, I just wanted to get your, your just maybe just your intuitions on it, because now we're sort of diverging away from, from your area of expertise, maybe, uh, or extreme expertise, at least. But I, I actually think it's, it's, uh, it's a really interesting pursuing this idea that theory of mind, it's, it's, I, don't, I don't think it is an on-off property. And I think the proof for that, that it is a continuum, mm -hmm. is what we just demonstrated when you uh, searched your pockets or, or mm -hmm. pretended to do so. Because mm -hmm. I knew that you pretended to do so. You, th so there's one level in which you know, I speculate what's going on. He lost something. He's looking for something. And then there's another level where I assume that you're proving a point. But then I can add multiple layers to that. I can assume that you're doing this, you're doing this because you want to make a good podcast. Maybe you empathize with me. Maybe you want to help me make a good podcast. And then we, we can just keep adding. Let me give you another example. So this, morning, this very morning, no, it's not true. It was yesterday, last night. I, I realized that I was talking to you and Gordon Gallup today. Mm. And... You're specialized, uh, you're not specialized in mirror neurons, but you were talking about mirror neurons and Gordon Gallup invented the mirror test. This is just a weird coincidence, right? And, and then I started, did I prime myself subconsciously? Did I reach out to one of you guys and then this mirror thing, some sort of schema was activated in my brain that let me down an association chain that <laughs> let me ultimately, uh, so I reached out to the next person but then I and, I, and I actually intuitively rationalized, oh, that's probably what happened. I primed myself subconsciously, but then I took a step back and said, no, that's ridiculous, right? Because I don't have any evidence for that, really, right? other right. than one word. <laughs> but that's, but doesn't that sort of prove that theory of mind, this might be a misguided and broken theory of mind in my head, but, but it certainly has multiple layers to it. Yeah, I mean, certainly you, you raise an interesting point is that part of our theory of minding activity is we apply it to ourselves because we do stuff that we don't always understand. And we try to figure that out and rationalize that. Um, right. Classic examples of that come from split brain research. That is some of the most fascinating research, yeah. Yeah. right? So people, uh, so I, I mean, do, do you want to give that example? Let, let, let's dive into it a little bit. It's just so great. I'm sure most people watching this have, have never heard of it. So, okay. Yeah, so it's a fascinating, um, fascinating demonstration. So the, it, it, as a treatment for epilepsy, um, people came up with the idea of cutting the connection between the two brain, the right. two sides of the brain, the corpus. Extreme collection. cases of epilepsy, right? Extreme cases. And the logic of the therapy was that if a seizure starts on one side, it can't spread to the other side and that will mm. reduce the, the, the scope of the seizure. And it turns out it actually works reasonably well, but it produces people with two brain, two brains essentially in the same head that aren't talking to each other at the same at the same you know, degree, that the, there's some separability. So if you just met someone on the street, you wouldn't know it, but if you give them a test um, designed to expose one side or another to a stimulus, you can show clear distinction. So right. classic example is you have a person looking straight ahead at a screen, on two sides you flash a couple different pictures. Let's suppose we put a picture of a, of a key on the left side the way that visual system works, that information would get into the right hemisphere, the right brain. Um, and then you can ask the person um, to reach under a curtain or reach in a box and feel around these objects without looking at them with the two hands and pick up what you saw. Um, and so the classic example is if you reach in with your left hand, which is controlled by the right side of your body, right, right. side of your brain, which is what saw the key, the left hand will feel around and pick up a key. And right. then you ask the person, why are you holding a key? And so now when you talk to them, you're actually getting a response from the left hemisphere because most of speech control is a left hemisphere 
dominated things. But the left hemisphere doesn't know but why. The left hemisphere doesn't know. <laughs> um, so you can ask them, what did they see? And suppose you, you know, had a picture of a cup on the right side. And they'll say, well, I saw a cup. Because now the right visual field, left hemisphere, speech is coming out of the left hemisphere. And they say, well, I saw a cup. Well, you say, why are you holding a key? And typically, they will make something up. They, they assume that there's a rational reason for that action. Mm -hmm. That is the, the, ten, the impulse to mind read. Um, and a story will be made. So it's like, well, yeah, I was looking for my key, and that kind of looks like it, and that's why I'm holding right. it. Right. So that's, that's an example of, that's an example of mind reading your own brain, essentially. Mind um, reading your own brain. That's, yes, that's very true. It's an internal circular theory of mind, sort of. Yeah. And, but, then, and that's really interesting because I remember hearing about these uh, split brain uh, patient experiments about 10 years ago, I guess. But, but recently, some, some other research came to my attention where they sort of place people in a situation where they, um, where they have to justify a choice they made. Mm -hmm. right. But they manipulated the stimul stimulus in a way <laughs> so they know that whatever justification people provide, it can't be true. So, okay, th okay, let me just, so the concrete example was they, so the, let's say I show you two photos of, of two different people and I ask you to choose one and 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 I also tell you, and and you have to be able to explain to me why you chose that person later. That's all. That's all there is to it. So and then you choose one of these uh, photos of complete strangers, of course. And then I put you through some other sham, um, <laughs> you know, a little puzzle or something that that uh, distracts you from this first task. And then I and then I say, okay, so here's the photo you chose. Now tell me the reasons you chose this guy. Um, and everybody, like everybody, is eager to present explanations. Oh, it's just I thought his eyes were kind, or oh, she reminded me of someone I knew, and stuff like that. But the problem is, the photo is of a new person. It's not the person they chose. Mm -hmm. But people don't recognize that because right. they just saw it for a short, brief right. period of time. Right. But everybody is happy to provide explanations of it. Right, right. That's well, that is really a fascinating. Uh, yeah. Field well, of how many times do we do that in our everyday lives? You know, we do. Do, do, do we not do it at all? No, we do it constantly, right? I mean, there are common things like how many times have you said to yourself, "Why did I do that? That's so right. stupid. What was right. I thinking?" Well, you're thinking about your own thinking, so presumably you would know, but you don't. So right. our right. actions, our actions are generated from whatever mechanisms that generate them. And they're not necessarily revealed to us that, you know, um, right. why we do these things. And, but we are, because of our tendency to infer causes, um, this tendency for theory of mind or for inferring intentions, we make stuff up to explain our own behavior. Exactly. And, and actually, one a practical application of this realization we just laid out here, for me personally, is I've started being a lot more thoughtful before I ask someone else, why did you do that? Because I'm essentially forcing them to produce an explanation mm -hmm. right here and now. Right. And that's not, that's not necessarily, that doesn't mean that they know why, but they'll produce an explanation and then that will be, that will become the why. Right. Right. Yeah, so that's that's typical of humans. We want explanations for things. There's got to be <laughs> yes. there's got to be a cause for whatever. Right. You see, I mean, we can go go crazy and and start talking about that as a basis for inferring the existence of um, omnipotent uh, supernatural powers. That you know, we see a mountain fall or a volcano happen. Right. And right. There's got to be an explanation for that, and without knowing about geothermal activity and things like that was, well, there must be gods that do this sort of thing. And right. Humans are, you know, you uh, believe in gods worldwide. So that's an, a, that's a theory of mind for, you know, natural phenomenon. Right. Um, there must be a mind, a, a reasonable mind behind these things. And that might be the explanation for religion. People have argued. That's not right. I, 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 I'm, I'm actually sort of in a very early stage 
uh, writing a book on that topic. But that, but, but, but recently, just last week or so, I I read a Bible quote. Don't ask me why I'm reading Bible quotes. I, I don't I don't actually know why. <laughs> so, and whatever I tell you, I'm just constructing reality as I make it up. But there was, I, I don't remember the specific passage, but it was, it was something about, it could have been Jericho. It was the destruction of some city. Mm-hmm. And then it's just casually almost noted after the fact or giving the, the city was destroyed. Oh, it, but it was obviously because the king of the city did this and that. And I was like, that's that's not logical at all. It's, uh, but but it but it was really interesting study in. I mean, when this stuff was written down, people this this is way before Newton and and. Uh, I mean, I guess, I guess people forgot the the Greek philosophers for for a little while yeah. here, but th- but this whole it's almost uh, and this is a speculation on my part but sometimes it almost seems that that in the past people wouldn't even distinguish between correlations and causal relations yeah so um i mean that's that's true today we you know um it's easy to ignore the dissociations i mean think about uh astrology, uh, you know, horoscope kind of things where you, you see the connections. Those are easy to see. Oh, that sounds just like me. Or, oh, my horoscope said that this would happen. And lo and behold, something similar happened that I can interpret as right. you know, something like that. But I see experts do it too. But when it, but when it misses, uh-huh. we, we don't notice it. So we're, we're, we seem to be built to identify cause and effect relationships. And there, there must be a reason for that. Presumably that had some evolutionary advantage for us you know that that seems pretty obvious yeah hearing a rustle in the bushes and then you know and then seeing something have we we better be able to make those kinds of causal relationships and so erring on the side of inferring causation when it's just random might be an an advantageous uh strategy i'm i'm even i'm I'm gonna go as far as to say that it must be good yeah because we're here and that's how we are Right. <laughs> and 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 it's uh yeah it's fascinating okay okay i i, I do want to jump on to the um to the bonus questions but okay i have to, okay th- consider these part of the bonus questions okay. as a neuroscientist what are your thoughts on N- nlp NLP, define NLP for me <laughs> so they call it neuro-linguistic programming i thought you were familiar with it well, yeah. Uh, are you I mean, as a psycholinguist, natural language processing is also. Oh NLP. my gosh! So, I'm sorry. Yeah, you got to be absurd. careful with acronyms. Right, right, right. So, so explain it to me. In uh, I don't. I don't know, really know anything about. I, I know a little bit about it, but it's it's a system developed 30, 40 years ago, I think, and and they really just stole this name before they even investigated it uh, on on any sort of neurological level. But I guess it has to do with priming other people to manipulate their behavior, essentially, not to do evil necessarily. But and and the I guess the theoretical framework is is could be correct would be the most yeah. <laughs> accurate way of describing yeah. it. But I don't think there's any evidence that it is. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it, so maybe okay, that, all right, maybe that tells you something about its status in the. Right. No, it's yeah. <laughs> right. And, you know, there's this whole world of of priming and social psychology that was right. getting lots of attention and has you know a lot of those effects have have kind right. of like, not been replicated. Um, right. So, so I mentioned um, Neuralink, Elon Musk's uh, yeah, side yeah. gig. This yeah, company. Yeah. I, I, it it actually strikes me that the core principle they use is also just applying electrodes. They're a little more sophisticated, but that's, that's essentially what they're, have you looked into that? I haven't, my, um, I don't think they're gonna get very far, um, to be honest, I think. Oh, it's, interesting. Uh, it, it's just too complicated a system um, to, to be able to, to do much with. I mean, famously, um, we've been able to identify the entire neural circuitry of, of the flatworm C. elegans. 
<laughs> right. And, and we still, and it's not a complicated system compared to our brains, and we still don't understand how it generates behavior. Right. So, you know, if, if we can't do it for a flatworm, um, I think the likelihood of doing it anytime soon for a human brain is very so. I so I see your point, and I and I and I can see why that must mean that we're not going to have an understanding of it. But I actually think they have a very just on the basis of of, of the, the the stuff I read about it online. I think they have a very practical approach to it. Uh, like almost like programming so maybe they maybe they 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 give you they um install your i don't i'm sure they don't call it install your your you they plant your seed right to use a black mirror term um so so it it initially it might just um collect data and it, it and then it can sort of see okay when he's sleeping this is how the pattern looks and then it could simply you could you could just press the copy paste button, and then <laughs> theoretically you're gonna just sleep when you do that. Yeah, the the measurements are there. The resolution of the measurements just aren't enough. Mm. Um, it, it, even if you could record from every cell, I mean, think about it. We're talking about what is it, eighty some billion neurons. And you tell me. <laughs> yeah, and trillions of they keep changing the estimates, but I think it's eighty some billion trillions of connections. Um, I mean, just do the math. How, the the time it would take even to make those measurements. Right, right. If we're hard. talking about this number squared, that's yeah, that's disturbing. Yeah. Yeah. So we're talking about um, immense complexity. Right. Um, and we're, I mean, we're trying to understand simple circuits, you know, I mean, uh, that do simple things. And it's even that is complicated. Um, right. So uh, I, I, I have zero hope that Elon, zero. <laughs> okay. that Elon Musk will be able to do what he's trying to do. Wow. That's based fast. on, you know, what I know about neuroscience. Okay, so I guess the, the, the future Martians won't be as smart as he <laughs> intends them to be. Well, okay, that's uh, that's that's great. I'm glad I asked about that actually. <laughs> okay, okay, Greg, let's dive into the bonus questions. And um, I did prepare you already that they might be a little outrageous, but um, the, I've, I've tried to um, to structure them so they they increase in intensity. So we'll start out relatively soft um, by me asking you, what is a thing that you used to believe? that you no longer believe? <laughs> um, ah, well, well, broadly, uh, I used to believe in God, don't anymore. Um, so you, you did? You grew up in a... Yeah, I was raised a proper Christian. Um, okay. So that's one thing. In the science world, I used, to, I used to believe that language was all in the left hemisphere. It turns out not to be the case. So there's right. one little kind of trivial fact. So, <laughs> right. Plenty of things. I mean, here's the thing. A lot of times you read stuff in textbooks and, and then you go and look into them, go back to the original sources, um, and you find out that they're not true. So my approach to almost everything is, okay, so that's the story. Let me look at the original, you know, the basis for that story and see if right. it holds up. And more often than you'd expect, it turns out that the the evidence doesn't support the idea it's it's so i i live and breathe by that same codex but um at the same time i'm becoming increasingly aware that you can't question everything there's not enough time i mean i mean you can question anything yeah, yeah no there's not enough time there's not or, or cognitive resources for yeah. that matter yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm uh, ranting on this. This is a great answer. Um, okay. So I, oh, I keep modifying this question. I'm going to give it to you in the, um, in the new form. I actually decided against this, but if you could travel to any historical, no, if you had to travel to any historical period and stay there, when and where would you go? And stay there. Oh, I mean, you uh, go back to the 80s if you want. It doesn't have to be thousands of years. It would definitely ago. be in the modern. I mean, just being practical-minded, it would be in the modern time after, <laughs> an, after penicillin was discovered. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> um, 
but you know, historical times that I would be interested in observing, there are lots. I mean, I would love to see what it was like in ancient Rome or ancient Greece or, um, you know, around the time of the Renaissance when people were kind of d making these discoveries in science. Man. It would be fascinating to see uh, what was actually happening there. Right. Okay. But definitely, if I had, to, if you were going to force me to choose, it would be sometime after, whenever Dylan uh, <laughs> was discovered. What was discovered? Penicillin. Penicillin. Okay, I just I didn't hear if you said fire or a penicillin. <laughs> <laughs> right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, okay. Which fields do you see the greatest future potential in? Which fields? Um, I mean, the, you can, actually, let me go back to the previous question. There's stuff that I would love to know about human evolution that we that are is pretty much intractable. I would love to go back 300,000 years when early humans just started out and to see the landscape of what else was out there. Right. Whether Neanderthals could talk, had language, all those questions. Fascinating. Right. Anyway, so I, I mean, I mean, they they found. Um, so I actually used to study prehistoric archaeology. So I know that um, almost have a bachelor's in it, <laughs> whatever that's worth. But I know they found several graves of Neanderthals uh, with musical instruments. I remember yeah. one grave with a flute in it. Yeah. So playing the flute with no language conception. Well, I think they, I think they did. But oh, know, they, they must have had. I'm, 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 yeah. But okay, yeah, I'm it would sure. be fascinating. There's, there's also right. debates about the evolution of language, which are fascinating to me. It's really so fascinating. Us to go back and see what our early ancestors were like. Anyway. All right. Um, all right. So what was your next question again? My next question is, oh, this is an easy one. Free will, real or illusion? Oh. Well, you skipped one. There was one that I, I went back to. You want to go back to the... Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. I was just testing whether you have free will. No, <laughs> no, I didn't know. No, no, which areas or fields do you uh, see the greatest potential in? Um, well, there's certainly the most to discover, I would say, in neuroscience. I mean, one of the things you learn becoming a neuroscientist is, that, is how little we know. I mean, we, we know the amount of knowledge has increased quite a bit. Um, but in, as a proportion of what we don't know, it's trivial. I mean, there's, you ask any neuroscientist and they'll tell you the same thing. There's so little known. And so much, much opportunity for deep understanding of, of this incredible system we have between our ears. So um, right. that's, I'm sure, a biased answer since it's my field. But there you go. But, then you, but there's a probably a reason why that is your field. But yeah. Yeah, but it, it's it's disturbing. I um. So so I'm a I'm a psychology major, and and I remember feeling and thinking, man, being a, a psychology <laughs> grad student, even just twenty or thirty years ago, there was it must have been so much easier. <laughs> and yeah. and, I, and I don't mean to to be disrespectful to my dad, who's also a psychologist. And, um, but but it, it's just I, like I remember this. Like every time I I had a finished paper ready, I was oh it's actually ready to hand in. But I'm like I I, I would be a fool. It would be irresponsible not just to look at if, is is there any neuroscientific research on this? And there always is. Mm -hmm. And and it just adds a whole another layer to it, and it, it's very complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Knowledge explosion is, is a thing. Right. There's so much to know these days. Right. We should come up with a fancy name for, uh, you know, like the Cambrian explosion. <laughs> right. We have an equivalent, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So on moving on to the free will question, do you believe in free will? Uh, yeah, I do. I believe in constrained free will. So I right. mean, we have biases. Any species has biases in the kinds of decisions they make, but, um, yeah, I mean, I feel like I have, uh, I have free will to make decisions and uh, guide my actions. Right. No, I feel it too. But then again, is it true? Yeah. Mm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it, it it might be one of those things where I the more I look into it, the 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 less I believe in it. But it, all this knowing fully well that I'm going to live my entire life pretending like I do believe in it and I have it. Yeah. Well. <clears throat> it, I mean, it gets it gets complicated and interesting when you think about it more. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, right. 
So, I mean, there are people who have argued that uh, from an evolutionary standpoint, hiding um, the, the truth from us is something that is an evolutionary advantage. Um, so Robert Trivers has a whole book on it, uh, which is very, a very interesting read. You might, might be interested to check it yeah, out. Yeah, absolutely. Basically, it's this idea of self-deception where um, uh, we, are, uh, we do things and, and the motivations for why we do things are hidden from us because if we consciously thought about it, we might not do it, but it's evolutionarily advantageous. Things like that. Interesting. Right. So, you know, you can muck with the idea of free will in various ways. That's one of them. Um, right. Yeah. It, right. At the end of the day, I, I feel like I, I believe in free will. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm happy to accept that. But that's actually very fortunate because this next question wouldn't make any sense if you didn't. If you had a magic wand that could grant you two wishes, what would you ask for? And you can't ask for more magic wands uh two wishes in what context are we talking about general life or are we talking about my the, career the, the, these are magic wands <clears throat> There's nothing left in any of them. um yeah i don't know. i mean i was about to say i would like to know everything <laughs> You know, give me give me the knowledge to understand all these things I don't understand. But then, I'm afraid that if I knew everything, it wouldn't be fun anymore because there would be nothing more to do. Right. So, so you actually okay. So that's an answer. I actually had a. I was moving on to the question I called the Odin question. Would you give up one of your eyes in exchange for all human knowledge? But you just answered that question. Yeah, I I think, I think it. You know, I. You know, if you're playing a game or watching a sports game or doing something, the fun isn't in the answer. The fun is in, you know, playing the game. Right. If, 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 if we sat down to a board game or whatever your favorite game is and we put it on the table and then I just said, well, you won. Congratulations. <laughs> right. There's no joy in that. There's no fun. It's the it's the process that's fun. Right. We could we could like, maybe we could sync our neural links and, and the computer <clears throat> could just tell us who would win. Yeah, right. Oh, you would win. There would be no fun in that. Or you know, right. a big game that you were anticipating all season, you're into sports, and you find out, oh, your team won. <laughs> right. It's like, uh, okay. <laughs> this is not fun. So yeah, no, it's not I, mean, the fun, it's I would love to know things, but really the fun is in the discovery. So I, I don't think I would wish for all the knowledge. That's that's a great answer, Greg. And uh, uh, yeah, I would I would have answered otherwise, but I'm gonna have to revise my my thinking on that topic now. I think. Okay, uh, you. Okay, so it's amazing. It seems like you your answers anticipate the next question I'm gonna ask. Uh, and and I now it's happening again. I can read your. <laughs> <It's a mirror. laughs> great. Okay, so. Um, what single question would you like answered? And in this case, I'm actually going to ask the next guest on the show this question. But I want you to ignore that. I want you to ignore that. I want you to assume, pretend like my next guest. Guest is God, an all-knowing being. Uh, okay, so, I mean, one single answer Um well, right now, the one thing that I'm extremely curious about is, and something that is really hard to understand is what I mentioned already. Uh, right. How, where, how language evolved. What were our... our how, I'm going to write it out. How did language evolve? Yep. I made a typo, but okay. I'm not that neurotic. Yeah, okay. That, I mean, that, I would love to know that answer, just kind of within right. the scope of the stuff that I'm currently thinking about. I'm, I mean, in, in your luck, I'm, I'm, it's probably going to be Gordon Gallup, who's the next person I talk to. And he's, he's probably going to have at least something to say about that. So, so that's, that's is, something. The problem is he won't know because <laughs> no one really knows. But yeah, <laughs> let's, see, let's see what he says. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay. Uh, okay. So we're moving on. We're almost getting there, Greg. And um, this is what I call the extended trolley problem. I'm sure you're familiar with the trolley problem, but this is even worse. So I want you to um, cl close your eyes and oh, this has nothing to do with mirror neurons. Imagine that you've been kidnapped by a sinister person in a dark clo cloak. He presents you with two buttons. 
and insists that you press one of them. So the red one will kill off half of humanity, randomly chosen, which is currently around 3.7 billion people. The blue one will only kill one person and the person won't suffer, will simply cease to exist. But you must choose that person. What do you do? <laughs> I must choose that person. Oh, so I'm responsible for it. Right. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't kill that many people. I would have to choose one. Right. So, I, I, I mean, I really have to ask you almost, <laughs> who, who would you kill? Who would it be? <laughs> right. Um, I would... Don't choose, say your mother I would law. choose a random person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that's silly. <laughs> you would choose a random person. I, I would choose the poor, you know, the person who's on his way to be killed by somebody else. Right. You how could choose that? the. Could, how about the oldest killing. inmate on death row? Or yeah, something there you like go. that. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So here's another one. Um, so if you could press a button, there's a button again here, and resurrect all people that had lived for the past 2,100 years, would you do so? And before you answer, we're assuming that we're dealing with a headcount of 1 billion people and that the Australian government had agree has agreed to house and feed them <laughs> in a sustainable, low-carbon footprint manner. Would you do it? I wouldn't do it. You wouldn't do it? No, I'm not... Uh... You could meet Darwin and... Jesus, even perhaps, and I think some things are best left alone. Mm. Okay, yeah, this, is the, this is the way nature works, and I really don't want to be messing with nature like that. Right, right. All right. Uh, this question, I'm definitely not going to ask you. Okay, okay, I am going to. So the sinister person in the dark cloak is back, and this time he gives you a simple choice: you must swap bodies with a person who will then inhabit your body. So, so I, I, would, I was going to ask you, who do you choose and why? And then I realized you're a neuroscientist. There's, there's a problem here, right? Okay, so the sinister person, so, so say it again. So he wants you to, to choose a person to swap, swap bodies, bodies with. with. Would, I, would I do it? Is that the question? No, you have to do it. I have to do it. You just have to tell me who you're going to swap with. Who I would swap with. Um, and I would live their, their life as they lived it? Yes. I mean, if you have a twin brother, that might be a... <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it would be... It would be amazing to, to live a life where you make some, you know, you see massive changes in the world or make some discoveries, someone like a, a Darwin or an Einstein. Mm. Um, but, you know, I don't know, the, the, personal, the personal side of it is important to me. And so, you know, I don't think I'd want to live Darwin's life, um, losing a kid, um, right. going through- Unhappy you know, marriage. Be, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I'd want to do that. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right. These questions get harder as they go. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm, I mean, this is sort of a test run for me, so I'm really glad you're you're even playing this game with me. <laughs> okay. Um, final question. Looking 50 years into the future, what aspect of human life do you think will have changed the most? <clears throat> Coastal living. Come again. Coastal living. Oh, co I, I, not cost of li coastal living, coastal living. We're going to lose a lot of coastline. Sure. Uh, no, uh, you know, technology, I think uh, it's really hard to predict, right? I mean, technology is advancing massively. Um, right. And there's going to be a lot of changes uh, and they're almost impossible to predict. Um, but yes. there's going to yeah. be some technological advances that that really change things fundamentally i think um but not our neural links no not that not that <laughs> all right great on that cheerful note um thank you so much for talking to me
My pleasure. It's great to talk to you. Well. Also, um, just before we wrap up, anywhere you want to lead people, if they want one more you. If they want to explore, well, I'm on Twitter at Gregory Hickok. So if anyone, you know, kind of wants to see what's up in my world, that's usually where I uh, send it out. Um, All right. So yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, if you want to know more, more about mirror neurons, there's there's my book. Um, I'm happy to answer questions <clears throat> via email. You can look Google my name. You'll find you'll find me around various places. So. Right. That's a dangerous thing you're saying there. I know. That's the... <laughs> All right. <laughs> Just a few thoughts on this interview. Greg and I had a great time. I think that's pretty obvious for anyone listening to this. Uh, and I also think we had an interesting conversation. But I do regret not asking Greg more questions about language production in the brain. That is his area of expertise. I think I was too focused on the questions I had I'd, uh, written down beforehand. So this is a learning experience for me and I do feel that I'm improving all the time. So you can look forward to that. All there is left for me to say now is thank you so much for listening to the MetaQuest podcast and you will find a new episode out very soon. And without spoiling anything, the next episode I'm going to publish is one of the most interesting conversations I've had for many years, actually, so you can definitely look forward to that. So, thanks for listening, stay tuned, and have a good one. I'm going to ask for 34 seconds of your time to listen to my pitch here. Have you ever wanted to start an online business? Well, ClickFunnels is a one-stop solution where you can build product pages, sales pages, accept payments, manage domains, create powerful marketing campaigns, and even send out your products. It truly is a one-stop solution for your business empire. I've used it since 2017, and you can try it for free for 14 days. Just click my referral link below. And even if you just go for the free trial, you can spend that time studying all their video courses. You can actually gain a significant knowledge about sales and online marketing strategies just by using their free resources. And it's all very tangible and practical. Again, please use my link in the show notes below. Cheers.